Sia on the guard, Kani Kolaha Dagodoa, Gahi Rege Gidoa. Hello, everyone. My name is Roy Boney Jr. I'm glad to be here, and I'm a Cherokee language program manager. My name is Chris Copes. I uh, work as associate professor in the linguistics department at the University of New Mexico. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about the Cherokee Language Dictionary Project. Uh, we have, uh, over the years, we've spent a lot of time you know, collecting word lists and other uh, items for uh, language learning. Uh, but we're going to kind of go through how we've been given a, a task with the current administration to update the Cherokee Language Dictionary and expand it and turn it into a digital archive project. So you want me just to dive, dive right in? Okay, let me get my notes open here. <coughs> so when you think about a Cherokee dictionaries, most of the time people are talking about Cherokee word lists. Uh, they're just a basic, a basic Cherokee word with a translation, maybe sometimes a brief uh, definition. Uh, so when you go back historically, people have been trying to uh, collect Cherokee language dictionary content uh, as long as there's been documented Cherokee writing. Even a bit before that, uh, one of the earliest pieces of, uh, 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 one of the earliest attempts at getting a Cherokee language dictionary was back in 1819. Uh, that was by Reverend uh, Daniel Buttrick and Daniel Brown. Uh, they put together, they called it the Cherokee Spelling Book. And this is prior to the invention of the Cherokee syllabary, so it's in this very interesting set of phonetics. But that was one of the earliest documented forms of a, a Cherokee word list or a dictionary. Around the same time, there was a linguist named John Pickering that was uh, putting together a Cherokee word list. Uh, his intent was to actually make a, a universal Cherokee, or not Cherokee, but a Native American alphabet. And so that's why he's collecting these Cherokee words so he can make that system fit into his alphabet. Uh, around the same time that some Sequoia was working on the syllabary, so what had happened at this point is once the syllabary was finalized and Cherokee people started using it, a lot of people in the community started putting together their own word list. And then when it moved to the printing press, that's when the Cherokee uh, government and a lot of the missionary groups started putting together Cherokee words too. So all throughout the 19th century, you'll find a lot of collections of Cherokee dictionaries and Cherokee word lists, and uh, they all kind of would form some of the same core groups of words throughout the century. Uh, so when you look, jump forward a bit to uh, statehood, when they shut down the printing presses and things, as uh, there are more people in the community that started doing their own word lists. One of the most important people doing this was Levi Gritz. Uh, Levi Gritz was a, traditional, a, a traditionalist and he was a community leader. Uh, but he started a Cherokee word list around 1890. Uh, the actual document is in the Gilchrist Museum in Tulsa, and it's referred to as the Cherokee Language Dictionary. And so it has about 9,000 entries, and he collected this content over the course of his life. So roughly between 1890 and 1950, he was putting together this, this really uh, great source of Cherokee language material. Uh, so in the 1970s, uh, a researcher named J.T. Alexander I took the content of Lev Levi Gritz's handwritten dictionary and put it, formally compiled it and published it as a book. Uh, this particular book would form the basis of a lot of subsequent Cherokee language dictionaries. Uh, one of the most uh, well-known ones is, it's it was printed by the Cherokee Heritage Press. Uh, it's, it's got an orange cover and all our speakers refer to it quite a lot. They call it the Orange Book because it has an orange uh, hardback cover. But that particular set of words, again, would form the backbone of a lot of things. If you go to Cherokee.org, there's a word list on there. That word list is coming from that particular set of uh, words as well. But around the same time, again, in the mid-70s, the uh, Cherokee Bilingual Education Program was established in uh, northeastern Oklahoma. And what they were doing was uh, they were going out interviewing elders uh, and speakers and capturing content, language content. They were doing stories, but they also started compiling the a Cherokee language dictionary. Uh, this was done by Durban Filling and William Polte. And again, they were going out to the communities, collecting words from, from as many people as they could. And what made this uh, project unique was that up until this point, almost all of these uh, Cherokee dictionaries, you know, they were basically wordless. Again, they were simple uh, Cherokee word, 
translation and maybe a short definition, but the Cherokee English Dictionary from 1975 actually started putting, uh, it was a true dictionary in the sense that it had definitions, parts of speech labeled, and it, had, and it even had a very detailed uh, analysis of the Cherokee grammar and tones. So it became a very, very useful piece of reference work. And so from 1975 on, that became like the gold standard for Cherokee language uh, references, uh, reference materials, especially for a dictionary. And so, you know, that was one of Durbin's uh, greatest life works. And so I had the pleasure of actually working with Durbin. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago. But while we were working with him, one of his uh, big uh, desires was to have this dictionary expanded. Uh, so we started actually working on an expansion of the dictionary while he's still alive. Uh, we started going through the entries. Uh, Durbin went through and edited some of them because some of them had typos from back in the mid-70s. Uh, we interviewed some more people, got a handful of new entries, new words. Uh, but then, unfortunately, Durbin started uh, following the ill health, so he had to retire. Uh, we continued the project uh, as he, you know, he, he was still here with us and we were getting his input as we went about this. Unfortunately, when he passed away, you know, one of our promises to him and his family before his passing was, you know, we were going to complete this project. Uh, so one of the, uh, since that time, uh, the current Cherokee Nation administration has, uh, with the help of the Cherokee Council, has allocated the Cherokee Language Department a, uh, a three-year uh, funding cycle where we can complete a new revision in addition of Cherokee Language Dictionary. We started this project in uh, 2021 uh, on the particular dictionary. So uh, we're wrapping up the first year uh, of this project. In that first year, we've actually, uh, we started doing an analysis of a lot of existing Cherokee language content. Uh, so, you know, a lot of these word lists I mentioned, we've been going through uh, recording them, analyzing them. Uh, we've been getting a lot of the translations that uh, our our staff has done over the decades for like the Cherokee Phoenix and various other publications and items that the Cherokee Nation puts out. And even existing historical content from universities and other archives, we've been gathering all this content into one centralized database. So with the first year of the project has been basically doing it. It's been a data gathering task. Uh, we just recently finalized on a specific type of software that we're going to use to analyze and house all this data. We have staff that are inputting the data and we're working with uh, our speakers and various communities and staff to you know make sure this is doing we're doing this correctly. So first year wrap up we're doing this type of work. Second year we're going to transition we're going to continue this but we're going to transition into uh, more uh, I guess concrete uh, ways to, how we're, how we're going to display this content to the public, how can the public interact with it. So we're going to design a digital uh, digital dictionary. Uh, so we're in the early phases of working towards that particular goal. Uh, by the end of the third year of uh, this funding, we hope to have a, 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 a first, a, I guess, new edition of a digital version of the dictionary. There are plans to do a, a printed dictionary, but those may be a bit further down the road. And so I had mentioned this three-year funding cycle. That doesn't mean that this project ends after the three years. This is just the first uh, round of it. It's going to be an ongoing project. Uh, and as long as we have Cherokee speakers among us, we will keep doing this. And so this kind of ties into another aspect of this project. Uh, in addition to the dictionary aspect, uh, we have been tasked with recording every Cherokee language speaker that you know, that's still living. Uh, so we're developing a mobile uh, audio studio uh, so we can actually pull this this trailer up into a community or to an elder's house if they can't come out to us you know we'll, we'll make ways to get to them and we're going to do uh, we're working with Cherokee speakers to become the interviewers too so all these interviews will be conducted in the Cherokee language uh, we're training the interviewers on how to uh, do a, a more formalistic uh, survey so when they're speaking with this person they're interviewing they're not just getting basic details about this person's life, which is great, but we want them to elicit certain forms too that may be lost. Uh, we're looking for types of uh, verbs and conjugations, uh, words that may have been lost, or, you know, old words, that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's a very interesting process and we're, we're hoping to uh, you know, capture this while, while we have our speakers here. And the reason that we can do this is 
prior to the pandemic, you know, Cherokee Nation started a survey where we were identifying all the living Cherokee speakers and as part of the Cherokee uh, speaker rollbook projects where we'd go out to the communities, uh, have a big uh, community feed, and people would come out and they would sign this book if they wanted to, to uh, you know, to identify themselves as a first language Cherokee speaker. So that particular project is uh, helping us identify all those speakers that we have that can we can get information from them and put it into this dictionary project because a, a, a part of this uh, survey was you know with the tribe reaching out to the community like this it, it got a lot of people more open to sharing some content they might not have uh, before so we're glad that we had the opportunity to do this uh, so all this collection of data and all this analysis of data is going into one centralized database that we will share with the public. We're not quite there yet, but uh, again, we're very pleased with the progress so far. And again, if anyone in the community has any content they want to share with us, we'll be glad to accept that as well. Uh, with that, though, I'll turn it over to my colleague here, and he can kind of explain his role in this. All right, thank you, Roy. So, as I was saying um, earlier, I'm a linguist. I'm um, I've been working on this project, the Cherokee Dictionary and Archive project, for the last six months while I was on leave from my university, um, the University of New Mexico. And um, before that, though, I've already been involved in Cherokee language documentation and Cherokee language revitalization for going on 20 years now in various capacities. So I've had a longstanding interest in the language and um, really the sort of the structural mechanic side of Cherokee grammar, the sound system. Um, and um, of course, if you do that kind of work, you are intimately familiar with uh, the dictionary that Roy mentioned earlier, uh, Durban Feeling and Bill Pulte's 1975 dictionary, which has been absolutely foundational for the linguistic understanding of Cherokee and a lot of subsequent research has actually been based simply on this extremely detailed and lavish um, documentation of the tones, of uh, the, the precise pronunciation of uh, the words. So we are now probably better positioned than ever to launch into this expansion of the dictionary and to kind of take the documentation of the language to the next level. And I also want to mention um, one of my collaborators, who I've learned a lot from, um, Dr. Hiroto Uchihara, who is now um, at uh, the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, who is an expert on tone languages, and he and I have previously collaborated on the documentation of Cherokee interview speech with a focus on actually getting all the tones uh, transcribed correctly. So he'll be involved in this project as a field linguist as well. So the, the foundational sort of aspect of, of uh, Durbin's work cannot really be understated. It's not just that dictionary that he edited, but also later verb books. He has a, a number of books in which he basically just compiled verbs because verbs are, in a way, the core focus of all linguistic work on Cherokee. It sort of revolves around the, the verb, if you can... If you can sort of work with the verb, you can pretty much work with the language. Um, and, uh, and so um, this sort of set a very high standard for the kind of work that we're doing. Um, and, um, and so just to give you a sense of what that actually means, when you try to say, say use a verb in Cherokee, um, you have to know a lot about how that specific verb works um, there are, of course, general rules of the grammar, which you need to know, but there are still a lot of individual sort of idiosyncratic properties of each verb. How do you create this form or that form? How do you use the form in a, the verb in a sort of command form? Or maybe you talk about something that happened yesterday or uh, that just now happened. Um, so there are general rules for this, but then there are additionally a lot of ways in which that verb kind of forces you to just do it in, in an individual way, and that all has to go into the dictionary. That's sort of what the dictionary is for, is to tell you everything about a verb that you wouldn't know from the general grammar overall. 
right? So that you're still responsible for knowing all that, but then in addition, you need to know things like, for example, for a noun, how do you form the plural? Like, is, how do you say multiple of this? Does this even have a plural? Some nouns don't have plural forms. And then if they do, they do it in different ways. So all of this information is sort of fine-grained, nitty-gritty structural um, properties of these jerky words, but uh, they matter if you really want to understand the language and if you want to use it correctly. And it's this aspect of the research which sort of sets apart a dictionary in the way that Durbin uh, and Bill Pulte set out to do it and what we're doing from a word list which is not really designed to give you all that information. Right, a word list has a much more practical purpose. For example, Roy mentioned the Levi Gritz list earlier. That list actually started out as, if I, if I understand the history of it correctly, started out as more of a, an aid for translating um, Cherokee into English. So Levi Gritz would be interpreting, translating English to Cherokee and Cherokee to English, and he would have to know um, you know, ways to translate one language into the other, but he already was a native speaker of Cherokee, so he didn't have to have all of this stuff explained to him. Right? It's really more of a memory aid, if you will. Um, and that's really different. So there's a very different target audience a lot of times for word lists versus dictionaries. Right? So you cannot really, um, you know, they're not mutually interchangeable. So what are we doing as far as the analysis Roy already mentioned? We, um, we're, our goal is to expand the dictionary. Um, and um, so what that means in practical terms is primarily to identify and then work out additional words, right? Or let's say verb stems or nouns, adjectives. Um, the dictionary f that was created in 1975 is somewhat limited. It has just under 2,000 entries, which is relatively small. Um, so it's not really difficult to find words that aren't in there. Although they did a tremendous job basically documenting all of the basic vocabulary. So now we're in a position where we have to branch out and we have to find, systematically find and document additional vocabulary. Some of it you can find just in conversation, as Roy was saying. Um, you can also go through existing word lists and just systematically f look for ones that aren't in the dictionary. We're doing that. But then there's one additional source that we've been working with quite a lot, which is that we're tapping into a variety of um, written Cherokee documents. So historical documents that were written in the Cherokee syllabary. And of course, Cherokee has a very long history of writing and literacy spanning about two centuries. So right now we're in the process of going through and uh, systematically looking through stories, historical narratives, or more mundane materials like meeting notes, and, um, and basically checking off the vocabulary items that we can that we can uh, identify in those. And so this is a good way to discover additional vocabulary, things that aren't used in everyday conversation. And one of the nice things about this is that um, as we're doing this um, together with fluent Cherokee speakers, is that we sometimes find words that a speaker will recognize as having heard maybe decades ago. Something like, I haven't heard this since I was a kid. This is something that the old, the old people used to say. I haven't heard this in years. Right? And so now we're able to bring that back because it's still in living memory, but some of these words have fallen out of use. Some of them have been replaced by other Cherokee words, but a lot of them have been basically replaced by English. And right? so these same ideas are now being talked about only in English. And so that's, in a way, that's the most um, amazing part of this work is that we're able to, to really uh, expand the, the scope uh, of the of the language and so far as it's documented, right? And it, it gives you also a very, I mean, to me personally, I have to say, it gives you a very great view or window into the kind of intellectual life of the Cherokee speakers over the past 200 years while it's been 
documented. So you find out a great amount of uh, things about the sorts of things that they talked about, that they wrote about, and the institutions that brought about this writing. Um, so that's, um, that's some of our research process. And uh, maybe, Roy, you want to say a few more things about the interview process or... Yeah, uh, we keep mentioning, you know, this all this content that has been made and, uh, over the historical period, even in even recent years. Uh, a lot of university archives and museums have a lot of tricky language content, so we've been fortunate to have access to this through various partnerships. And, you know, uh, most of this content is uh, handwritten Cherokee or even some typewritten Cherokee. Uh, it's never really been analyzed a lot. I mean, people have looked at it over the decades, but no one's really sat down and kind of start going through this and, you know, analyzing it, translating it. So that's what we're adding to this uh, set of uh, information is we are working with uh, a fluent Cherokee speakers. Uh, many of them are on the Cherokee language department staff. Some are contract translators from the communities. And so we're trying to be sure that we're uh, reaching a wide variety of Cherokee uh, speakers because one part of what we're trying to do too is to uh, uh, get different forms of dialect. So when you, you talk about Cherokee language, uh, there are different ways to say different words in different areas of the uh, community. Even within the, just the 14 county reservation area here in Oklahoma, uh, from the like the north, north, the more northern parts of the area versus the southern parts, there are variations in how words are said. So when we get into the interview process uh, of you know having these field interviewers go out among the community, uh, they're going to be speaking with uh, you know, speakers across the spectrum. And while they all can understand each other, there are words that they all say differently. So we're training these uh, Cherokee interviewers to try to get into these conversations and how to get the speakers to elicit this kind of information. That's why it's important that these interviewers are Cherokee speakers themselves. Uh, we're trying, we want to incorporate, you know, first language speakers as much as we can in this project because without them, you know, we won't have this content or even have the information of how to analyze it properly. Uh, so, you know, an, an example of that we've been uh, kind of pointing out to people is like if you go, uh, well, a lot of times when in the past when Cherokee Nation would go interview people in the community, we'd end up with a lot of, um, stories about, well, I grew up here, I went to school here, I did this, I did this, which is very valuable information, but uh, a lot of times that content is all in the past tense. Uh, so we're looking even to get people to talk about uh, things maybe in the present or even the future, what's going to happen, so we can capture some of those forms of the words that we don't have well documented. Uh, so again, the interview survey process is being designed in such a way where we're not just, you know, we're not going to have it so formalized where the interviewer will go in and say, tell me what this means in this form. It's going to be naturalistic so that we'll get the most, you know, the, the, the best way to capture the language is the more naturalistic way. So these interviewers, uh, you know, we, we have two that we're contracting right now. We plan to get a lot more out into the field once we get this going. Uh, they'll be working with second language learners too that will help them operate the uh, the technical side of things, you know, because we're going to have, uh, you know, speakers and cameras and all this. And uh, for the people that are being interviewed, if they're not comfortable being filmed, we won't ask them to be filmed, but we definitely want audio recordings from Cherokee speakers because uh, that audio uh, component is probably the most vital part of all of this. Uh, as Chris mentioned earlier, what makes the, the 1975 Cherokee English Dictionary very viable is one of the aspects is the tone uh, documentation. A tonal uh, variety in the Cherokee language is very important. You know, if you don't get tones correctly, uh, you know, you'll be saying something else entirely different. And it might, be the, it might look like the same word when it's written, but when you hear it spoken, that's when you know what the difference is. So it's, it's hard to do this analysis just by looking at written words, which is why it's so important for us to engage with uh, Cherokee speakers as part of the analysis. And so as they read these written words and they read them aloud, you know exactly what the content is supposed to be. And we're capturing that right now, you know, by this recording process. And again, in the future, uh, this content, we do want to share this with the public. So when we talk about a, dic a Cherokee dictionary, 
you know, right now, the 1975 Cherokee Dictionary, there, there are various volumes out there. It's been reprinted across the decades quite a number of times. The most recent edition was the 40th anniversary edition that was printed in uh, 2015. Uh, but uh, the book is a very valuable source of information. So it's always out of print. You know, people snatched it up pretty quickly. So we're hoping, you know, perhaps to reprint that one more time, but also we're moving more towards a digital format for this dictionary because the content will be constantly changing and growing as we go. And uh, one important thing to keep in mind is like kind of what Chris alluded to earlier and regarding, you know, Levi Gritz, you know, he was a fluent speaker and, you know, collecting this, these words he was doing was more, you know, almost like a translation aid. So he doesn't, doesn't need or didn't need a lot of that kind of content. So this dictionary is aimed at Cherokee learners primarily. Most speakers won't need this kind of content because they just know it and already have it. So, uh, you know, that's why we're focusing on a digital aspect because, you know, most people that are moving forward in the future, we're all going to, we're moving that way already. Uh, while, and, but we will do a printed version too. Just, you know, there are some people that don't like the digital world or are, are that comfortable with it. So we will have a print version, but the primary focus is on the digital aspect of this. Well, I would have to say, um, well, I'm trained as a linguist, but also as a sociolinguist. So what that means is that um, uh, my interest is not just in kind of the, the mechanics and this more, uh, these structural intricacies of the language, but I also see language and want to analyze language as, it's, as it reflects the culture and the society that it sort of evolved in. And, um, and so when I see words, like the words that we're looking at for this dictionary project, there are people behind these words, right? And there are generations of speakers. And so in a way, uh, when you analyze the language, you are analyzing, um, you know, that culture, right? So I think from that perspective, it makes the, the ultimately that's the, um, that's the thing that makes it the most interesting to me. So I'm finding out more and more every time I come out here to Oklahoma about the language and its speakers, really, and what the, what the words mean to the speakers themselves. And as I'm starting to become a bit more fluent in the language myself, I'm starting to be able to maybe think a little bit more along the same lines as somebody would who speaks the language natively. So it, it kind of forces you to kind of look at the world somewhat differently, right? As we all know, it sort of communicates a certain worldview, right? and though that's 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 fascinating to me. Great. Yeah, and what Chris, you might be too modest to say, is, but you know, he's been working with Cherokee uh, speakers for like nearly twenty years. I first met him way back when he was still a grad student, and you know, he was coming out to the community and working with our speakers back then, and. Uh, you know, a, a, a interesting thing about him as a person is, you know, he's he's a very nice individual. He's been ingrained in the community, which is a lot of times it's hard to do for a linguist to come in, especially an outsider. Uh, you know, there have been linguists that have come in over the decades to study Cherokee. Not all of them have been successful. Uh, so Chris has been accepted among our, our Cherokee speakers, especially the translation staff. You know, they, they, they love him quite a lot and they're always happy to see him come along, which I can't say for some other linguists that have come along. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And, you know, Chris has shown dedication to the, the Cherokee language uh, over this long span of time. And so he understands the goals that we are looking at for language revitalization. You know, he's been a part of it for a long time. Maybe not formally, but, you know, he's always been there uh, doing research. He shares his uh, documentation with us and he puts us in contact with people like Dr. Uchihara, who, uh, you know, he worked very closely with Durban, too, when he was alive. So both Chris and uh, Dr. Uchihara have been students of Durban's too. So, you know, Durban was uh, one of our foremost Cherokee speaker linguists himself. Yeah. So, you know, they learn from the best and we're, we're, I, we're hoping that we're carrying on a Durban's legacy through this work. Yeah, the, you know, there's a classification system that the U.S. State Department 
uh, does to, when they talk about world languages and the, the most difficult levels, level four, and that's like a language like Farsi and Arabic. Cherokee is in that same classification. Uh, and one of the, the biggest reasons is it's, it's very tonal. You know, again, you can read it, and if you, you know, reading, learning to read and write Cherokee is actually fairly easy compared to speaking it. Uh, you know, I grew up in a, a family of Cherokee speakers all my life, and I'm not fluent. I know some words and things, but even, you know, you have to be immersed in the sounds of it very deeply. So that tonal aspect is probably the most challenging part of it, because if you get one tone wrong, you're either not saying something, you might be saying something you didn't mean to say that might be off color. I mean, it's, it's a very... Uh, a, a challenging way to you know be among speakers you might make a mistake and get laughed at but that's part of the learning process and the other aspect is you know it's a, a polysynthetic language which means you know the the this, I guess simply the words are broken down into small pieces and so these pieces can be switched out like the prefixes and suffixes and uh, to the stem and according to how this happens it might change certain vowels are dropped and constant sounds are changed so you, to the, know the language, you have to understand all this. But as someone who's, uh, you know, our first language speakers, they, they know this inherently. They don't have to think about all these rules when they're speaking. So as a, a learner trying to learn this, you know, sometimes you might, it's kind of overwhelming. Sometimes you get flustered trying to remember all these, these rules of syntax and things. So, mm -hmm. you know, the best way to learn a language is to just to hear it and be immersed in it. And so having a tool like the dictionary will help learners with that. But again, you got to be able to really listen to it and hear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you were asking where, where is the complexity, I, all of the above, <laughs> right? So Roy already mentioned the, the pronunciation and then the morphology, the, as we call the morphology, which means the just sort of the word structure. Um, if you come at it from an English language perspective, it's easy to think that you can sort of s switch out one English word for one Cherokee word. Like I went to the store, so there should be a Cherokee word for I went to the five, and you just have to know those five words and then you can say it in Cherokee. But it's not at all like this. There are differences at, at all levels. So you might put four out of those five things into the verb, right? And maybe the word I, you just leave it out. Maybe it's in the verb too, right? <laughs> and so th there are these, there's, there are these, there's a sort of a lack of correspondence at all different levels and and one thing that doesn't get talked about as much but even at the level of meaning um, there are there's a lack of correspondence so for example there are no in Turkey there are no direct equivalents of the words come and go there are a number of words that mean go but there's no one word that means to come um, you might use the word that's usually translated as arrive to say I came here which is doesn't really it's not intuitive. You'd have to know that, right? And you find this at all different levels where you might see a word translated as um, say, but it's not just say. It's, it may mean all other kinds of other things, or um, there might be other words that also mean say. And so this, this is something that you have to really learn through a lot of experience to know how to express the same meanings which words sort of work uh, in Cherokee as opposed to English. You can't take for granted that there's like a one-to-one -one mapping, which which you do have if you learn, let's say, you know, German or Spanish, something like that, where you can work with this one-to-one -one switching out for quite a while and you pretty, it takes you a long way, whereas with Cherokee, you're, it's, it's not going to help you much at all. In fact, it's going to make everything look really complicated. So you have to sort of, you have to really start from scratch and you have to really start to accept that there are differences at much at a much higher level things that you have not really even thought about that could be different suddenly are different so Yeah, as part of the, the process of collecting this information, we are marking, you know, where a particular speaker may be from uh, and even pulling out words that are different from what other speakers may know when they are interviewing them, although they might know, you know, this word for car might be different from where they are So over here. So as part of the data, again, we are marking that 
And even in when we start doing a more forceful out in the community interview process, we will, uh, in the interviewing, uh, uh, capturing that data, you know, we're going to be generating these, these maps too, showing dialect areas uh, and focusing on certain words and saying, well, here's this word here, here, and here, and this is the differences. And we can, the goal is in the long run, like let's, you know, in the future when this generation is gone, someone that knows their family, they may be from Bell, they can look at this data and say, well, this is a Bell dialect that we captured, we have this information here. Uh, so that this is part of the uh, metadata process too, which we, uh, as we collect raw data of recordings and just interviews and reading written words, we also are embedding this into this uh, database system I had mentioned earlier, uh, where we can actually tag all this content by, uh, you know, community, uh, and we are, uh, we've been talking mostly about Oklahoma Cherokee. We are, are working with the Eastern Band on this project as well, so we're going to have a section of, you know, Eastern dialect, and then and then we come to the Western dialect, that has its own smaller subsections of how things are different, so we are, we are going to be marking all this. Yes, uh, you know, we, we have all these, uh, over the last few years, we've been sending teams out to all these different places, these archives, and taking high resolution photographs of all this. And we have the permission of these institutions to do this too. Uh, you know, so we were, we're forming partnerships. You know, some people will say, well, that's our content anyway, which you know, they may be true, but we are being a good steward of this and making sure we're getting this, these, I, um, a good partnership because we're sharing the data with everyone too. And so all of this historical content, we have them organized by uh, where they came from, what the content is. And so we are slowly intaking this into the database software where we're tagging everything. And we're also uh, translating all this content, uh, which is you know kind of a slow process, but we are, we've translated several hundred so far. We're recording this as well, so it'll all be housed together. And uh, the ultimate goal too is uh, this the software that we looked at, we actually had some people from Australia come out and train us on how to use it. They're the ones that developed it. They made it to work with the uh, Aboriginal languages in Australia. Uh, so they created the software that can quickly uh, search uh, the smallest pieces of data and language content. So we're adapting to the Cherokee language and as part of this process, we're you know, tagging everything through the metadata process by intaking these images that we've taken, uh, putting them into the database, and then we can sort it out and actually by the end of it, we're gonna have a dictionary, but also in addition to that, uh, with all this content, we can use this, this new information to make other uh, projects we might not even foresee yet because we're going to have all this uh, very viable Cherokee language data so we can make new apps and things. We're uh, exploring the idea of doing like a virtual Cherokee assistant, kind of like a Cherokee Siri. Uh, that's a long ways away, but with this content, we have to feed it into you know, a centralized system that can analyze that and you know, generate the audio content too. And, we are, and all this audio recordings is all going to be tied together. And so it's a pretty ambitious project, and I mentioned you know we have this three-year time frame to get at least one edition, a version of the dictionary out. But that doesn't mean we're quitting. We're still going to keep on going with this uh, particular process. Okay. Yes, yes. So I, as what I was saying, this the process of going from, let's say, a uh, a letter that's in an archive that's written in the Cherokee syllabary to actually the kind of content that is useful for the for our purposes for our purpose of creating a dictionary and also uh, a searchable archive um, there's a lot of steps one of course is to translate it right um, but also um, to record the words basically right now we're working with you know a large number of speakers who just read the these uh, the sentences right and um, this is really important because, as we were saying earlier, the, the way that the language is spoken or the way that it actually sounds is not always very easily seen from the characters the, in the Cherokee writing system, especially the tones. So there are about six different tones or pitch contours on every syllable, and those are not written uh, because the writing system was designed really for speakers who already know that. They don't need to have that, but um, 
it is tremendously important for properly documenting the language for someone who doesn't already know it. And so um, that's sort of the process that's fairly time consuming. Um, but, and so that's why this is really a sort of a longer term effort. But at the same time, um, coming back to your question about these documents, um, what they really allow us to do from the dictionary making perspective is to find these words that we have in the dictionary in a natural context. This is something that doesn't go without saying for um, indigenous, indigenous language uh, dictionaries. They're not, all, they're not very often based on a large text corpus. They're very often simply based on somebody saying, yeah, I know this word, this is what it means, here's how to use it, done. Whereas in much better documented languages like English or German or French, lexicographers work with actual textual documents, right? So they'll, they'll not just say, okay, this is what that means, but they'll look for it, how is it actually used, who used it, when did it come into existence. They really trace the history of these words. And with Cherokee, because Cherokee has this very long tradition of writing and of, you know, historical documentation, we're in a position where we can do something like that through these documents, right? So we can actually find, uh, get a much more nuanced um, perspective on what the words mean and how they're used. And uh, it's often full of surprises. You find the same word um, used in ways that aren't, were not previously, at least you didn't find that information in the dictionary. So for example, there's a word that today, most people will say it means to be born, but you can also use it just to say live, to live or to be around at a certain time, you know? And so there's something that really I've, seen now in more and more documents, and so we probably have to adjust the definition of that word through those documents. I guess um, sometimes when you look at older texts, you really see how the language has changed. So even in the, in the Levi Gritz um, list, as Roy was kind of reviewing the history of that word list earlier, when this eventually started to be published and made into published, you know, dictionaries, um, they already at that time noticed that a lot of these words are no longer in use because it ultimately goes back to the late 19th century. Um, so it kind of gives you a sense of the, the change that has happened, right? Um, so that's something that's not really so obvious when you first approach the language, but you also have to factor that in. And sometimes you, have, you may have to factor that into the definition of a word, too that this may be an archaic uh, uh, meaning that no longer exists, or, um, yeah, that today there might be other ways to say that. Right? So that's, that's interesting how you, you see that this sort of uh, historical unfolding of the language. And it's not really until you, 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 you have that perspective through these documents that you find that out. Well, the, the most immediate thing is, you know, to, you know, Cherokee Nation has a lot of different offerings for language online. Uh, probably our most famous is the, the, you know, the online class with Ed Fields. You know, thousands of people have taken that class, a lot of them you know, at large citizens. Uh, but they've taken it over and over and over. And there have been a few, a uh, handful of learners that have come out of that are, are pretty conversational from that over the years. So we have that part with Ed Fields online. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel, a, a Cherokee Nation YouTube channel that has a lot of language recordings on it. You can listen to uh, Cherokee speakers, you know, just talk about various things. And sometimes, you know, some of these are translated in subtitles, sometimes they're not. But even if you don't understand what's being said, it's good just to listen so you can get the, the sounds of the language. So check out the Cherokee Nation YouTube channel. Uh, we also have... Uh, the weekly uh, radio uh, broadcast in Cherokee language, you know, from Dennis Six Killer, Cherokee Voices, Cherokee Sounds. If you're not in the area and you can't catch it on air, uh, they put all the episodes on uh, SoundCloud. So if you go uh, to the app and look for Cherokee Nation, under the album section, there's a part that says Cherokee Voices, Cherokee Sounds. It has uh, not all of them because there are over almost a thousand episodes on that that have been done over the decades. Uh, we are in the process of getting that available, the archive out to the public. 
Uh, but in the meantime, you can catch, catch that uh, online as well if you're not in the area. Uh, we have a partnership with Rogers State University, uh, which offers a Cherokee 1 and 2 class that's all online. You can either take it for credit, which of course you got to pay tuition, or if you want to take it for free, you can just watch all these videos on YouTube. There are currently 96 episodes uh, of Cherokee language content online on uh, YouTube through the uh, Rogers State University uh, channel. Uh, that's uh, each episode is 50 minutes so it's almost an hour of content for each episode so that's quite a lot of content we're working on uh, 48 more episodes and these uh, are also broadcast on the roger state university tv station uh, which has a website too and you can watch these online as well and that's that's geared more for uh, uh, learners at the maybe high school or, or college level but it's a good class too and it's a good way to hear uh, it's taught by a second language learner, but he incorporates first language speakers into it quite a lot. So you get to see the interaction and see uh, a good way. It, it's geared at learners, so it, uh, with the, the instructor Wade Blevins understands what learners need to start getting conversational. So with his uh, experience as a learner bringing in these uh, speakers, it's good to watch those and get, get that feeling of how people actually learn. Uh, in addition to that, too, there you can go online and there's on social media. There are a lot of people that are forming groups that uh, just uh, informal study groups that are getting on and working together. Uh, there's a group for second language learners that just started recently that's kind of growing in popularity. And speaking of dictionaries, there's a group called the Cherokee Online. There, I think it's CherokeeDictionary.net. That's a, a, a community-based, uh, a wordless gathering group. Uh, you know, they're taking all this content, a lot of that we're talking about, they're putting it online as a volunteer basis and they maintain a server and they have the searchable word list document on there, which is a, a pretty good way to get access to the words that you may not know quickly, you know, and so there's a lot of uh, ways to get in touch and get in contact and a big part of it is online. And as you mentioned too, uh, Cherokee Nation is starting an at-large Cherokee language program and through that we will... Uh, we're going to have an instructor that will, it'll be, they'll focus on online, but also do in-person events too. Uh, we'll probably have some contract instructors for the various uh, different community organizations out there as well. So it'll be a hybrid of on, online and in-person.